Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see all you, all these smiling faces and the groovy ones too. <laughs> Good morning. And today uh, we have a sermonette before the message, before my message. We, he, he's got a message. So let's ask God's blessing and we'll get started right away. I want to welcome our international audience also. Father, we thank you for each one who's here today and watching by the internet. We ask now your blessing on, and, and inspiration on the on the messages, on the speakers, and on the hearers, and help us to take to heart the things we hear from your word. Please, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, without further ado, I would like to <clears throat> introduce to you a young man who has his bachelor's degree from Ambassador Christian College. And he's coming back to get his master's. And is officially now deciding to come and get his master's degree this year, so he'll be a master of theology <laughs> this year. Uh, <clears throat> the indefatigable... Mr. Willie Cuevas. How's everyone doing online, brothers and sisters in Christ? Um, good, you know, morning. To, good morning, good morning. You know, Dr. Keith likes to give good titles. I mean, I'm just a regular person, used by God. <laughs> so um, today's actually sermon that I wanted to preach on, actually, um, what God had gave me the other one day, um, and if you want to title this, this is called, Do You Trust the Lord Jesus or Not? There is no middle ground. Um, if you go to Mark chapter 9, verses 19 through 24. Mark 9, 19. Now it says in Mark chapter 9, verses 19 says, He answered and said unto him, and he says, O faithful generation, how long shall it be with you? That how long shall I suffer with you? Bring him unto me. And this this little bit backdrop, um, it's a base about the disciples trying to cast out a demon out of a young little boy who they couldn't do it, and Jesus had to cast it out for them. So, and then he says, And they brought unto him, unto Jesus, and when they saw him straight away, the spirit tear him and fell down on the ground and wild foaming, foaming. And he asked his father, how long ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. So Jesus is asking the father, how long does this ago has occurred? And the father said, as a child. And it says, oftentimes he has cast him into the fire and into the waters and to destroy him. But thou has, can't do anything. Have compassion on us, help us. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Straight away, the father of the child cried out, said, with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. So my question is today, have you been trusting God today for something, whether it be miracles, whether it be, whether it be financial increase, whether it be increasing the finances, or, or have you been trusting in God in certain areas, just like, the, just, just like back in Israel, Israel traveled to the Red Sea and, and, and got out of Egypt, and they didn't go to the some of them didn't go to the Promised Land because of their unbelief. Or are you, are you are you like Abraham, who Abraham didn't sta stagger in the promises of God, but believed God? Or have you been staggering and, and, and unwavering and believing God in certain areas and say, well, you know, today, you know, I believe God, but tomorrow I may not. You know, I believe God in certain areas of my life. I believe God for healing. I believe God for blessing. I believe God for financials. But I don't believe God in, 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 in helping my child or helping me grow, helping me see God. And the thing is, my question is to you. Do you struggle to believe God in all areas of your life? Not just one area, but all areas. Because if you don't believe God in one area, it's disbelief altogether. Because the Bible says it's, it's impossible to please God. Because to, to please God, you must have faith. Faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith on what he did on the cross. Faith that, that you're saved. Not hoping, not wishing, not praying, but faith. Not, 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 not just hope, but know that you know that you know that you know that you're saved. Not by, oh, well, maybe the doctor comes in, he gives you a bad report on your, on your nose. You know your, your finances are going to struggle. You know what I'm saying? You're going downhill. Do you believe God in all his ways? Or are you hoping that he will see you through? Because we know as brothers and sisters in Christ that love God, those who love God will keep God's commandments, Jesus Christ says. Those who love God will do what God calls them to do. He says, all things work good to those that love God according to the purpose and will. And my question is, 
Are you just like this, this, uh, this father says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief? Or are you a type of person that says, you know what? I'm going to be like Abraham Abraham, and believe God and not stagger in the promises. Believe him full fortly and leave him regardless where he takes me, where he doesn't take me. I believe that he has everything under power in heaven underneath his control. Thank you. We might... Uh... Might let you do a radio broadcast one of these days. Uh -huh. Never know. You got your Bibles. We have up here on the PowerPoint the scriptures we're going to be reading today, and the title there is "What Does It Mean to Have the Mind of Christ?" Let's open up our Bibles to to the last part of what is called the Sermon on the Mount. Now we've talked about that before. It wasn't a sermon. It was on a mount, but it wasn't a sermon. It was actually a sit-down Bible study. And Jesus was, was, no matter what people think, the movies have it wrong when they show multitudes of people coming up there uh, to see Christ and to hear him preach thousands and thousands of people. It wasn't that way. The Bible says in Matthew 13, without a parable spoke he not to them. And yet when you read what is called the Sermon on the Mount, there were no parables. It was just plain teaching. So the people who were multitudes, the public, he only spoke to them in parables, <coughs> but to the disciples he spoke in plain language. <coughs> so when you read Matthew 5, verse 1, where the, the so-called Sermon on the Mount takes place, it says, he was sitting down, and when he was sitting down, the disciples came to him. Now the Bible makes, a, the New Testament makes a great distinction between the multitudes and the disciples. Remember this, I think this is in uh, chapter 13 of Matthew as well, where he spoke about, you know, the wheat and the tares and so on. And, and then it says, and then after the multitudes, you've got to compare Matthew with also Mark to get the whole story. It says the multitudes left. They went home. And then it says, and when he was alone, again, you've got to read this in Mark's account as well. When he was alone, his disciples came to him, and then he explained to them the parable. Why did he explain to the multitudes? They said, declare unto us the parable, meaning we don't know what you're talking about. Even the disciples didn't get it. So he explained it to them. Now, if Jesus knew that the people weren't understanding the parables, and he knew they weren't, why did he bother talking to them in parables? Anybody got an idea? He knew they didn't get it, but he kept doing it. Anybody know? To uh, help his disciples uh, know the deeper things of God. To help the disciples do what? Understand the deeper things of God. Yeah, but but he knew that the multitudes weren't understanding it. Why do you suppose he spoke to the multitudes in parables when he said he knew they didn't understand? Remember the scripture where he said, their hearts are waxed gross, their, their ears, they're closed, you know, neither do they understand. He knew they didn't understand. Well, the answer, did you have a comment? The answer is, is found in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 8. Had they known who he was they would not have crucified him it says the rulers of the people just didn't know and remember sometimes the Pharisees were called the rulers of the synagogue who was it that put Christ on the cross don't blame the Romans the Pharisees the religious leadership brought Christ to Pilate Pilate said no I'm not going to crucify him he's innocent and they said if you don't you're not Caesar's friend and Pilate's head was already on the block. You may not know that. You don't know it from just reading the four Gospels. But when you study Roman history, Pilate was already in trouble with Caesar. One more infraction, and he would have been literally beheaded. Because they were pretty rough in those days. So Pilate, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the priests of the temple forced Pilate to crucify Jesus. But Paul said if they had known, if the rulers had known... Those rulers of the synagogue, those Pharisees and Sadducees, had they known who he was, Paul said they wouldn't have crucified him. Well, what's the problem there? Jesus said, it's recorded in the book of John, for this cause I came to this hour. If they hadn't crucified him, then we would still be on the hook for the punishment for our sins. Christ came to die for our sins. In John 17, he said for, you know, he was born to be a king. But in the, uh, what is it, about the 12th chapter, 11th or 12th chapter of John, he also said he came to be crucified. So the point is, had they known and understood, they wouldn't have crucified him, so the plan of God would not have been carried out. So he clouded the meaning. So they had, 
I mean, they knew what a tear was. They knew what a wheat was, but what, what does that have to do with anything? They'd go home and say, what was that all about? They didn't know. Like uh, years ago, how many of you remember the show called Hee Haw? You do and you do. Okay. Some of you may not remember. <laughs> they had a guy named Grandpa Jones on there. And one time they were sitting there on the couch talking and Grandpa said, you know, it's just like I always say. And he came up with something that just was really nuts about the water rolling down the hill, watering the grass and all kinds of silly stuff. And Roy Clark says, Grandpa, what does that mean? And Grandpa Jones says, I don't know. It's just something I always say. He didn't know what it meant either. <laughs> So you know the literal meaning, okay, I know what water is, I know what it means to run down hill, but what's that got to do with what we're talking about? So they would hear the parables, and they'd say, okay, I know what he said, but I don't know what he's getting at, and they'd go home. So the disciples would say, declare to us that parable, so that he would put it in plain language, because they were his followers. They're not going to crucify him, but the Pharisees had him crucified. I used to wonder, wait a minute, Paul said, I'm following Christ, you follow me as I follow Christ, and yet in 14 epistles, Paul never gave a single, a single parable. Paul never gave one parable. And I wondered, why doesn't Paul preach in parables? Because now it's time for people to understand. The parables were given as riddles where the, the public could not understand. Now they were put in the Bible so that the church could later, with the Holy Spirit, read them and understand them. So the Holy Spirit gives us understanding. Let's go to chapter 7 now, the last part of this, and look at verse 21. Jesus said, and all this is in red letters here, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, now he said it twice, because he hears that a lot from Christians. The good Lord did this, the good Lord said that, the good Lord this and that, the other thing. Not everybody who says that to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he, but, here's the one who will, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now some people hear that and they think, oh, he's teaching legalism. <coughs> no, that is ridiculous. We're under grace. Now remember Matthew was written years after the cross. Some people think it was in the late 30s. That's pretty early. Some think it was in the mid 40s. We don't know when Matthew was written, but it was written years after Calvary. He says, you've got to do the will of the Father. Well, now, wait a minute. If I'm under grace, why do I need to do the will of the Father? Because you're not under grace any more than Adolf Hitler was until you repent of your sins and say, from this day forward, I'm going to do your will. When God hears you say that, and you mean it from the heart, he'll put you under his grace. I read recently somebody who didn't understand this, some I hope it wasn't an ordained minister. I hope he wasn't that ignorant. He said, you know, none of the Gentiles, they're not under the law. That's ridiculous. Every single human being on planet Earth is under the law. That's the only way they can be saved. The Hindus, the Buddhists, they may not know the law, but they're under the law. You know why? They have no Savior. The only way a Muslim, the Muslims will tell you this, the only way we can be saved is we got to do good works because they don't have a Savior. We do. Muhammad did not die for anybody. Mohammed couldn't save them. The Hindus, if you ask a Hindu, I've met Hindus, what, what do you uh, have to do to, to, to enter into nirvana? That's their heaven. Got to be a good, a good Hindu. Got to do good works. If you ask a Jew, what do you have to do to make it into God's kingdom? Got to do good works. But Jesus said you need to be perfect. Under the law, you better be perfect. You say, but I can't be perfect. I've tried. I've worked on it. It hasn't worked. Okay, here's the thing. If you will come to Christ and you repent and say, from this day forward, I will serve you. He puts you under his grace at that time. The Jews are under the law, but so are the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Taoists, the, the Sikh people. That's S-I-K, I think, the way they spell it. Um, the Shintoists, all these people, the only way they can be saved is under the law, even though they don't know the law, which is unfortunate because that's the only way they can be saved. Now, if a Hindu hears the gospel, and comes to Jesus Christ and says, man, I've sinned, I've done bad things, God, will you forgive me? And if you'll forgive me, I'll change. God will forgive them, and God will put them under grace. The only people here who are under grace, because you weren't born under grace, you were born under the law. The only people here in this room who are under grace, and anybody watching over the Internet, are those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. You can be the best Jew and the best Hindu and the best Muslim, and you're not going to be saved. All right, that's my sermon. Okay, let's get back into the Bible study. <laughs> so you've got to do his will. He said that. 
he said, but now here's the thing. You can call him Lord, Lord, all you want to, but if you're backslidden, you're not going to make it into God's kingdom until you repent. Now, I hear the Baptists say, well, once saved, always saved. Live any way you want to. Go worship the devil if you want to. Once you're saved, you got it made. I haven't heard them say go worship the devil, but if you cannot be lost, That's true. They do say if you, Charles Stanley, I've, I can read this to you if I had brought his book today. He wrote a book called Eternal Security. Charles Stanley said you can reject Jesus Christ and still be saved. Yeah, no. It's in his book. Go buy it. It's called Eternal Security. Charles Stanley, the most famous Southern Baptist around today, said even if you reject Jesus Christ, you can't be lost. I disagree. So does, the Bible. so does the Bible. Well, I haven't. This is not in my notes, but go with me to Luke twelve. I want to show you something. I just thought of this. Luke twelve. What is a servant of God? It's one who serves God. Okay, Luke twelve verse forty two. The Lord said, "Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord Jesus shall make ruler over his household?" Luke nineteen tells us about how that God is going to make us rulers in the kingdom of God to give them their portion of meat in due season. Blessed is that servant, that's you, you're a servant of God, whom his Lord, that's Jesus, when he comes, that's the second coming, shall find so doing. I knew a minister some years ago in Oklahoma. I said, why don't you build a church? Oh, Keith, there's not enough time, not enough time. He told me that 30 years ago. He had time, he just didn't want to do it. Of a truth I say, so you need to be doing, need to be working when Christ returns. Even though he's coming back tomorrow, you ought to be working today if it came back tomorrow. Of a truth, I say that he, Christ, will make him the servant ruler over all that he has. Now listen to this, verse 45. But if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. I thought he was coming back in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s or certainly by the year 2000. My Lord, Jesus, delays his coming. And then that servant, now Christ calls this man a servant. The Hindus, the Muslims are not servants. A Christian is a servant. You folks in this room who are saved, you are servants of God. If that servant says, well, Christ hasn't returned, and he begins to beat the men servants and the maidens and to eat and drink and be drunken, in other words, he backslides, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looks not for him, and in an hour when he's not aware, which is exactly what the Bible says is going to happen to the sinners, and will cut him, the servant of God, that's you. You're the servant of God. We'll cut him in sunder. The margin says cut him off. And we'll appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. What does that mean? You ask me. What does that mean? Whatever it means, is that something you want? Does that, maybe it only means the unbelievers are going to have to go through the hardships of the tribulation. I don't want that. Maybe it means the unbelievers in the great white throne judgment after the millennium. I don't want that. What does it mean to be to have your portion with the unbelievers? The unbelievers are going to go through horrible tribulation before this is all over. And you're going to have your portion with them. Although you are a servant. So all the Baptists who are watching over the internet, you may still be saved. You may still have your your secure salvation, but you're going to bust the tribulation wide open. You're going to be where the unbelievers are. The unbelievers are going to go through the tribulation, and so will you. Yes, sir. What does the Bible say is the unforgivable sin? The unforgivable, there's only one unforgivable sin, and that's when you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, and the way you blaspheme the Holy Spirit is when you simply don't want to come back to Christ. You're a Christian, you're a servant, but then you trod over his blood the blood wherewith you were sanctified, Hebrews 10 says, then there's no forgiveness. Yeah. Well, you know, just like you were saying, if you uh, call yourself being saved and then you go back into the world and serve <coughs> Satan, that would be the same thing as an unforgivable sin, would As Unless, now Hebrews 6 verse 4 says, if you fall away, it's impossible to renew you. How do you know when a person's fallen away? A person has fallen away when they cannot repent. Now that person you're describing 20 years later, if he still can repent, he hasn't fallen away. Totally. But here's the problem. You may get so far away from Christ that you don't want to come back. You get to the point where you cannot repent. Now you're going to be lost. Yes? Would that be the same thing? It would be turned over to the reprobate mind. Yeah. Turned over to a reprobate mind. That's in 
the book of Romans chapter 1 where it says he, they don't like to retain God in their knowledge. So he gives them a reprobate mind where they, if you want to be disgustingly abominable, he'll let you. Hmm? You have a question on it? Okay. Does God not put in the heart consciousness which is from the law to do good? Consciousness in the law to do good? Consciousness from the law to do good. That's what the question is. The question is, does not God put consciousness in from the law? Which to, is from the law. Which is from the law does to God do good. Does God not put in the heart consciousness which is from the law to do good? I think everybody does have a desire to do good or to be good. Not necessarily I'll always do good as the Bible defines good, but everybody you meet justifies themselves. I'm a good person. They want to be good. Then you show them what good is. Here are the Ten Commandments. Oh, I don't want to do that. They want to be thought of as good. They like the idea. Hmm? They like the idea of being. Yeah, they like the idea of being thought of as good. People think I'm good. I'm a good man. I'm a good person. But then when you show them what it means to be good, then they say, well, I don't want to do all that. If you really want to be good, follow Christ. And Christ kept all the commandments of God. He said in John, what is it, 15, I believe this. He said, I have kept my Father's commandments. And Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2, 21, that Jesus is our example. Now, if he's my example, then I also need to keep God's commandments. In 1 John chapter 2, I'm going to read you one verse over there. Good questions, by the way. First John chapter 2 and verse 17. The world passes away. So if you're going to follow the world, you're in trouble. And the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will. Jesus said you must do the will of God. He that doeth the will of God abides forever. Oh, but I'm under grace. I don't have to live right now. I don't have to live righteously today. Yes, you do. Because if you're like that servant who goes out and drinks with the drunken and eats with the gluttons, and uh, beats his fellow servants. In other words, if you backslide, you will have your portion with the unbelievers, and the Baptists don't believe it. But right there it is. It's in red letters, Luke chapter 12. You must do the will of God. If you're taking notes, I'll give you the scriptures. You don't have to look all these up. There's one verse I want to read you in Psalm 40, verse 8. It says, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, now what is God's will? Well, I think, I think, I've heard, I, no, no, no. What does the Bible say God's will is? I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Jeremiah 31, 31, when you get the Holy Spirit, God puts his law in your heart. That's his will. If you're saying, well, the law's been done away, then God's will's been done away. Because his law is his will. And of course, God's word is is defined as his will. That's a comparison between Mark 3.35 and Luke 8, verse 21. When you compare the two, Jesus in Mark's account says, do the will of God and you'll be my family, my spiritual family. Luke's account says, hear the word of God and do it, you'll be my family. The will of God and the word of God are one and the same. Well, the word of God is loaded full of instruction. The Hebrew word is Torah, which is translated law. Any questions? Yes. I have a question. So a lot of people... You know, they say they're saved by grace, and I think a lot of people think that they just want to barely make it in. Yeah. And want they want the they want the title and recognition of getting into the New Jerusalem and getting into the kingdom of God, but they don't want to do what's required. They don't want to do what's right. Convenience. They feel like, oh, well, I'm entitled to this because I'm saved. I guess I can do whatever I want. Yeah. And they don't want the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. Exactly. They don't want His lordship. They want to be saved, but they don't have to obey. And barely making it through. Yeah. Like I've heard people say, well, one of my best friends years ago said, I don't want to hear anything that does not have to do with my salvation. But then all you need is John 3, 16. Can you clarify that we know that the Ten Commandments are not the only laws and statutes we need to keep? Somebody yeah. Somebody online that's not a graduate and hadn't been listening long uh -huh. thinks that... That it's only the Ten Commandments? No, thinks that we think that only the Ten Commandments need to be obeyed. Oh, so somebody who's listening thinks that we think that only the Ten Commandments are the law of God. No, the book of the law is comprised of four chapters, Exodus 20 through 23, because in chapter 24, Moses got a lamb or a goat or something, and he or a bullock, and he sacrificed it, and he sprinkled the blood on the leaders of the 12 tribes. He called that the book of the law, those four chapters. So the, so the law is the Ten Commandments and the statutes and the judgments found in those four chapters. And Jesus said, not a jot or tittle of the law will pass away till heaven and earth does. 
I noticed driving in here this morning, the earth's still out there. So guess what? All the Ten Commandments are still in force and effect. Every single one of them are still in force and effect. Okay, now, uh, you brought up something uh, about grace. Uh, Romans chapter 2 and uh, verse 13 says this. Not, not the hearers of the law are just before God. Oh, I've heard the law. I've heard the Ten Commandments. I've heard the statutes. I've heard the judgments. Not the hearers of the law are just before God. Now, the word just, for those of you who are graduates, what's the Greek word? You don't have to know what the Greek word is, but do, what is... How is that Greek word elsewhere translated? Righteous. righteous. The word just and the word righteous are one and the same in the Greek, so it means the same thing. Not the hearers of the law are righteous before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified or made righteous. How are we made righteous? By the doctrine of imputation. God imputes righteousness to you. Romans 4 verse 3 says that... Uh, if you have faith in Christ, then God will impute righteousness to you without the law. Romans 3.28 says, we're made righteous or justified without the deeds of the law. So even though I haven't kept the law perfectly, now if I did, I'd be righteous. If you commit one sin, you're not righteous. One sin. It's kind of like you're wearing a, a, a beautiful, you man wearing a white tuxedo, or you ladies wearing a beautiful white, like a wedding gown, you're just perfectly white. And somebody takes one little speck of dust and flicks it on your, your garment and somebody says, oh, get that off. You're, everything is perfectly, you know, white shows up everything. Like you're wearing a white shirt. That shows up everything, doesn't it? If you wear, if you wear a solid white, man, you've got to be very careful where you sit and everything because you'll show up every little piece of dirt. And so if, if God gives you righteousness and then you, let's say that he didn't give you perfect righteousness, there's one little speck of dust there, you'd see it. It'd show up. If you commit one sin, you're not clean. You're unrighteous. The first John 1, 9 says his blood will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Any questions on that? So who is it that gets justified by faith? Who is it that gets, has the imputation of righteousness? Is the ones who are willing to do the law. Yeah, what? Comment, okay. The only way a person can have the law given in their conscience is to study them, learn, how to apply them, etc. Mm -hmm. from the Bible, God's instructions to those who claim to, be, to belong to him. Yeah, and how does God write his laws in our heart? We have to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. As we study God's law, then the Holy Spirit puts that in our heart. I've never memorized the Ten Commandments, but it's in my heart because I've read it so many times. The Holy Spirit works with me. Yes? Um, Merrick Waits, who is a uh, meditation on the law day and night, uh, meditating. Yeah. That's what saying over and over. That's in Joshua 1 8. Meditate day and night in his law. And if you'll do that, the Holy, with the help of the Holy Spirit, you'll you'll be written in your heart, and it, I mean it'll just be there. For example, I can't quote to you all the statutes and judgments in, in uh, Exodus 21, 22, and twenty three, but maybe a, a situation will come up, and I'll say, "How does God want me to handle that?" And I don't remember the exact statute, but it's in my heart. And I know how God wants me to handle it. You know, God will show you His will that way. <clears throat> In Luke, now you don't need to turn there, but in Luke 10, 20, Jesus told the disciples, don't rejoice because the, the, the devils or the demons are subject to you, but rather rejoice for this because your names are written in heaven. There is a book of life in heaven. Your name is written in heaven if you've accepted Christ and he's accepted you by giving you his Holy Spirit. You don't get saved because you receive Jesus as, let me explain what I mean this if you just simply say, I receive you as Savior, you're not going to get saved. Now, that makes a lot of people upset, but I can prove it. If all you do is say, oh, yes, I'll receive him as Savior. I heard a lady say this on TV some years ago. She said, for the first 10 years, I had accepted Christ as Savior, but it wasn't until after 10 years that I finally acknowledged him as my Lord. And I thought, all that time, she wasn't saved. Romans 10, verse 9 says, if you confess the Lord, not the Savior, not the carpenter, not the prophet. He was all those things. Not just the Son of God, not just the Messiah. But if you accept and confess the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And you don't need to turn there, but it's just one verse. But Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord? Lord, do you want to do what I say? Why do you call me Lord? And he said, Lord, Lord. He hears it all the time. 
but you won't do the things that I say. Christ shows us what it means to acknowledge him as Lord. You are willing to do whatever he tells you to do. Go to India and be a missionary. And if he tells you to do that, you say, yes, Lord, and you go, yes, sir. It's almost like a boss at a job, and the boss has to do something. He's your boss. He's your supervisor. The word, the word Lord means boss mm -hmm. and ruler. And so, like, say, for instance, your boss asks you, hey, do this for me. You're like, yes, sir, I'll do it. You're not going to complain with the boss. You're going to get fired and get someone replace you. You say, yes, sir. Yeah. Now, you might say, well, I don't know how can you teach me, and he, he will help you, but you bet still better go do it. Yeah. I mean, when you accept him as your employer, he automatically, you assume he's your boss. He's going to tell you when to come to work, how long to take for lunch break, when you can go home. And you don't go home just whenever you want to. You go home when he tells you to. He is total ruler over you for those eight hours that you're there. And Jesus is total ruler or Lord over a Christian seven days a week as long as he lives. But here's the thing. We're Christians. And we're saved by grace. And we think, I can live any way I want to now because I can't lose my salvation. Once saved, always saved. Live any way I want to. And according to Charles Stanley, you can even reject Christ. Doesn't matter. If you went out and worshiped the devil, that would be rejecting Christ, wouldn't it? This question has come up sometimes. Do I have to keep the Ten Commandments to keep my salvation? Technically, no. The way you're saved is by faith in Christ. And the only way you will ever lose your salvation is if you reject that faith in Christ. In other words, I've got faith in Christ. God saves me by his grace. But then I turn around, and now I don't have faith in Christ. I turn my back on Christ. I don't have faith in him anymore. That's how you lose your salvation. A true Christian who is converted can go out here and trip over his feet, spiritually speaking, left and right. Trip up, goof up, mess up because he's weak in the flesh. He has not lost his salvation. Now, there are some people who think that if you backslide, you lose your salvation. Then you go up to the altar and you get saved again. Then you go back out and you commit a sin. Then you go back up to the altar and you get saved again. No. No. You don't get saved and lost and saved and lost and saved and lost. The Southern Baptists got that right. You get saved once. Now, listen. You're only going to be saved one time. If you ever give up your faith in Christ, I don't mean just stumble and slip up, but if you ever walk away from Jesus Christ, I mean totally walk away from him and no longer have faith in him, you're no longer under God's grace. You've had it. God's grace is for the repentant, not the wicked. Yes, sir. Well, if you take an example of David and Bathsheba, you know, he knew he sinned, so he went back and asked God to forgive him. And, you know, yeah. He restored his, his uh, blessing back to him. David did a dastardly deed. Stole a, one of his most loyal generals of the top 30 men that he had. He, he stole the man's wife. That was a dastardly deed. And then he did something even worse to cover up his sin. He killed the woman's husband. I've never known anybody personally that wicked. But David went to his knees and asked for forgiveness, and God even forgave that. So, And, and I'll tell you something else, too. Romans 8 9 says, if you don't have his spirit, you don't belong to him. In Psalm 51, when David repented, he said, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. He still had the Holy Spirit, even though he was a goofball for a while, but he repented. Uh, you have a question? Uh, I was reading in uh, John chapter 3, 16, where it says, believe it with a TH. That TH basically means that continue to believe. Continues to believe, absolutely. It's in, I think, the, what we call the middle voice in Greek, and it means a continuation. Not just you believed 30 years ago, but you believe today, you're going to believe tomorrow, you're going to believe 10 years from now. That's exactly, that's a very good point. And you haven't even had Greek yet. I have a question. That's good. Yes, okay. Um, that's good. Good question. Do you remember or a comment. Few, yeah. a while ago, we ran into one of our graduates that said, that, and we had invited, we invited them to come back to church. And yeah. They said that they were no longer religious. Yes, I remember that. How long is God going to be patient with them until he says, too late? <clears throat> All right, good question. How long will God be patient until God says too late when they get to the point where it's too late for them to repent? They may go 20 or 30 years, and then one day they do repent. So that means they, they're not too far gone. But Romans chapter 6 and verse 4 tells us that we've gone too far when we cannot come back to Christ. As long as you, like David, as long as you can come back to Christ, you haven't gone too far. So that answers, that's a long answer to his question. 
what would be the unforgivable sin? The unforgivable sin is the one you don't repent of. Not just you stole a candy bar and you forgot to ask for forgiveness. No, no. When you reject Christ and you don't repent of that, how can God forgive you when you don't want to be forgiven? How can Christ be your Savior when you no longer want Him to save you? God says, if you'll repent, I'll forgive you. No, I don't want to. See, that's what that is. Okay. Uh, now, let me go back to chapter 7 here. We're in Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> Excuse me. And verse 21, let me go back to that. He said, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven except the one who does the will of my Father. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And Jesus doesn't disagree. And in thy name have cast out devils? Well, yes, they have, and he doesn't disagree. And in thy name done many wonderful works. Wonderful works. They've built hospitals. They've built churches. They've built schools and colleges. They've given to charitable causes. They've fed the hungry. They've clothed the naked. They've given to the poor. And they've done it all in Jesus' name. And then will I profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Where's my m marker here? I want to write something on the board. This word iniquity is this word right here. Nomos is the Greek word for law. A is the Greek word that means without. For example, theism means belief in God. Atheism means without belief in God. Nomos means law. A nomos means without law. The actual translation is this. Depart from me, you that work without law. You're working and building all these hospitals and churches and schools and colleges, and you're doing all these wonderful works, but you're doing it without God's law. Well, we thought the law was done away. Our teachers told us the law was all abolished. One very famous evangelist on television has said, not only are the rituals and ceremonies done away, he says the Big Ten are done away too. He uses that expression. They're done away and abolished because he doesn't understand what Paul was talking about in one of his passages when he was writing to the Corinthians. No, the, the Big Ten, we're not under them where salvation is concerned, but we're still required to obey them to show our love. You know, under the law, you have to keep the law to earn your salvation. In Galatians 4 and verse 4, it says, Jesus was made under the law. He had no salvation apart from the law because he had no Savior. All right, so you and I are... are born under the law, but then when we find out we've sinned, we come to God and gives us his grace. Was there a question? Somebody's watching that's not a graduate of our school that we keep posting stuff. Uh-huh. That makes it look like we don't believe the truth. So could you explain again that we understand that keeping the law is tied to your reward and not to your salvation? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't keep the law to earn our salvation. Well, let me, let me be very explicit about this. I want to make sure you understand. You don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. Period. You don't have to keep the statutes. You don't have to keep the judgments. You don't have to tithe. You don't have to love your neighbor. You don't even have to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Because all that's under the law. And we're under grace. Now that I've said that, let me explain what I mean by that. If you have to keep the Ten Commandments, what if you break one? You're lost forever. Under the law, you've got to do all of it. Under grace, you have faith in Christ and he imputes righteousness to you. But that doesn't mean we should not as Christians keep God's law because Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And one of his commandments in Matthew 19, 17 is to keep the big 10. Jesus said, keep the 10 commandments. Now, the young man he was talking to said, well, which? And he starts quoting randomly at uh, Exodus 20, the 10 commandments. So yes, I believe in keeping all the commandments, all the statutes, all the judgments, all the do's and don'ts, but I don't do it now to earn my salvation. I'm already saved. I am already saved because God's given me his Holy Spirit. I know ultimate salvation occurs the resurrection, but I'm as saved now as a human being can be. I am saved. I have the Holy Spirit. If I died tonight, I'd be okay with God because I'm serving him. But under the law, you've got to serve him perfectly, and I have not been perfect. How about you? Anybody here ever been perfect? Nobody wants to raise your hand. All right, if you're not perfect, then it's too late now to earn your salvation by keeping the law. Well, then why bother keeping the law at all? 
Jesus said, if you love me, now we keep the law to show our love to God. I'm talking too fast, aren't I? Yes, sir. No. Um, wait, but in verse 15, which says, beware of false prophets, uh, this section 15 to 23 is just talking about false prophets, or it's talking about pastors, or it's talking about like, believers, or it's talking about everybody just in general when it comes to Bible. Well, it, uh, yeah, verse 15 says, beware of false prophets, but he talks about, if you read the rest of the passage there, he talks about people coming into the church in sheep's clothing. They look like a true minister of God, or they look like a true Christian, but you've got to be careful. Because they may be, they may not be saved. They may not be Christians, but maybe they think they are. Maybe they're deceived. They come in there bringing the doctrines of wolves and serpents and devils and that type of thing, and they spread throughout the congregation. So we have to be aware of people that, that even though they're sincere, they may be a wolf. I, I pastored a church one time where I was there for a few weeks, and I knew who the wolves were, especially one particular man. He, he basically destroyed the, the ministry there. But everybody thought he was a good Christian, and I knew right at the beginning that that guy's a wolf. Yes. Well, Pastor, don't the Bible say that it's better to be obedient than to sacrifice? Yep, to be obedient. God wants us to be obedient. If you're not obedient to the law, then you can sacrifice by going to jail or being persecuted or, you know, losing some of God's blessings. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a true saying. <clears throat> it's better to... Uh, and, 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 well, what you said was it's better to, 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 to yeah, obey than to sacrifice. To sacrifice yeah. That's uh, in the book of Samuel, but in the book of Ecclesiastes, it says it's, when you come into the house of God, it's better to listen than to offer sacrifice. I think it says to offer the sacrifice of fools. So there are people that go to church to say mass, to have mass, which means a sacrifice, but they don't go there to learn because they can't learn much in 10 minutes, and sometimes their sermons only go five minutes. Gnosticism means to know. Agnosticism means you don't know. So an agnostic is one who is without knowledge. So he's ignorant. These people work for God. They do many wonderful works, but they're doing it without law. And God says, depart from me. Now, we're not under the law where our salvation is concerned. We're under grace. But that does not give you license to commit adultery. Or to break the Sabbath. Or to not tithe or to take God's name in vain or to bow before idols or to covet your neighbor's house or to covet your neighbor's wife or to steal or to lie. You don't have permission to break God's law. In fact, let me give you a scripture that proves that. In Romans six fourteen, Paul said, we're not under the law, we're under grace. And that's where most people stop right there, but they don't read verse 15. What then shall we sin, which is the transgression of the law, because we're not under the law, but under grace, Paul said, God forbid. We're still not allowed to transgress the law, even though we're under grace. So we still are required to obey God. So let's say that a person, after he is saved, like I said, he trips all over his feet, he makes all kinds of mistakes, he's under God's grace. But what if I intend to rob a bank, and I intend to commit murder, and I intend to commit adultery? You know, David slipped up. He really didn't intend to. He was just watching this good-looking gal taking a shower or a bath or whatever she was doing. He didn't intend at the beginning to commit adultery, but, you know, Jesus said the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. He eventually slipped into that, and he shouldn't have, but he repented, and God forgave him. Yes, sir. Um, so with that being said, if a person is saved, but they don't keep the counts or keep the laws, it, so that basically displays that they don't love God. So are yeah. they saved still? A person could be saved and out of just ignorance and being misled by false teachers will not keep God's law because they don't know they're supposed to. But like somebody asked about uh, the consciousness of the law, wouldn't a person know he's supposed to do certain things? But that doesn't mean he'd know which day to keep as the Sabbath or, or to keep God's annual festivals. There are a lot of things he wouldn't know without reading the law. Uh, I'm not going to say a person's not saved, but see, we're saved by faith in Christ. There are people out there that uh, are probably saved and aren't doing hardly any of the law because God is very merciful. Remember in uh, chapter 18 of Revelation, verse 4, Christ says, come out of her, my people. Her who? Babylon. Christ has people that are today in Babylon, and they're just as saved as you are, but Christ is trying to get them to come out and start obeying God's law. There are people that spend their whole lives in a Protestant church. Yeah. And they spend their whole life in a church, and they may be saved. And yeah, that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But... 
church that the Sabbath was changed to Sunday mm -hmm. at Pentecost. That's mm -hmm. not true. No, but yeah. there are churches that teach that. But people, if they don't, if they just trust what their pastor says and don't dig for themselves, they're living in ignorance. Um, yeah. Jeremiah 17, I think it is verse 5, you know, cursed is the man that trusts in man. Don't trust in man. Go to the Bible and find out if that man's telling you the truth. But some people, I had some, uh, some a relative of mine tell me, when I when I explained to them that the NIV version of the Bible is just corrupt. It is, yeah. They, they said, well, the pastor uses it, so I'm just going to trust what he says. Yeah, I'm just going to trust what the pastor says, yeah. And that's why we have so many different denominations. We're trusting what men tell us. We're not going strictly to the Bible. One lady said, well, we pay our pastors to interpret the Bible for us. So that's why I don't read it. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I think it's because of the fact that um, people don't love the truth. The truth, they don't love the truth. So they're, they're being deceived with a lie and believing the lie. Yeah. And it's not a matter of not loving the truth. It's maybe that you're just ignorant, period. You just don't understand it. Some people haven't been shown the truth. And then some people are shown, like we have a lot of graduates that have been shown the truth, and they just smile and just say, yeah, but I'm not going to do it. A lot, most of our graduates are, they're not, they're not going to, they're not here today. They're going to be, uh, but they'll be in church tomorrow, and they'll go ahead and believe that Jesus died on Friday, that he was born in December, that he had long hair and a stupid looking halo. They'll believe all the same junk that I've tried to teach people is not true. Yes, sir. Yeah, and, they, and that's the one they forget. That's the one they forget. Now, uh, while I'm here, let me, let me, well, I'm still in Matthew 7, but I want to read you something here about the law in Romans. People say, why do you talk about the law so much? Because the New Testament's full of the law. For example, here in chapter, do you know that the word gospel, Galatians 1, 6 through 8, shows us that the gospel is the gospel of grace. In Acts 20, verse 24, it calls it the gospel of the grace of God. The book of Romans has the word gospel in it more than any other book of the entire Bible. And yet, listen to what Paul said about the law. In chapter 7, verse 1, Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Now, the word man in Greek means a person. How many of you are still alive? Okay, nobody raised their hands. All right, fine. <laughs> but for those of you who are still alive, the law has dominion over you as long as you live. Oh, no, the law was all abolished. My, my pastor told me the law was abolished at the cross. Look, Romans was written about 30 years after Calvary. And Paul says, don't you know the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? And don't say, well, you're not a man. Yeah, you're, the word in Greek means person, male or female. The law has dominion over you as long as you live. Oh, but I'm under grace. You're not going to be under grace for long if you keep rebelling against God knowingly. Remember the servant who, who knew his Lord's will and didn't do it? He's in trouble. He's going to have his portion with the unbelievers. Keep that in mind. In fact, there was part of that I didn't read. Let me go back to that real quick. I've got just a few moments here. In Luke uh, 12, I didn't read all that. Uh, you don't need to turn there, but it's Luke 12, 47. That servant who knew his Lord's will. Now, Jesus is our Lord, so he's talking about a Christian. That Christian who knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will. Remember in Psalm 40, verse 8, the God's will is his law. That servant, that Christian, shall be beaten with many stripes. You're going to be punished for disobeying the law of God. Oh, but I don't have to keep the law. I'm under grace. You just keep believing that lie of the devil, and you're going to end up getting beaten one day. Now, he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes, he'll be beaten with few stripes. He still gets punished, but God knows he's ignorant. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required. So for our graduates who have learned these truths, and they say, well, I'm just not going to do that because my Aunt Martha was a good Christian. She never obeyed God's law. So I know she's a Christian, so I know I can be a Christian too. Yeah, you are a Christian if what, you've been converted. What about our but graduates? you get your portion with the unbelievers. What about our graduates that are pastors that learn the truth that still go back and teach their churches? Yeah. Yeah, she, the question was, what about our pastors who know the truth and still go back and teach their churches the, the, the traditions of men? They're going to have to answer to God. John chapter 5. 
Christ said, all judgment is given to me. Romans chapter 14, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account. It's a dangerous thing. Hebrews chapter 10 says, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. One of the biggest problems that I have seen in Christian people is they don't fear God. They don't fear God. Fear doesn't mean to be afraid of. It means to have a reverential respect. Now, I wasn't afraid of my father, but I had a godly fear of him and that thick belt he had. And if I did something wrong, you know, the Bible says if you don't, if you spare the rod, you hate your child. My daddy loved me because he didn't spare the rod. So, I, so when he told me to do something, it's not like I ain't going to do that. Man, he'd have killed me if I had said that. Never once did I ever say that to him. And Paul said in the book of Hebrews, if we showed our earthly fathers reverence, shall we not show the, you know, God more reverence? Shall we show him the proper fear and respect? People are not, don't have that proper fear of God. They live any old way they want to, and they don't care. Now, you'll notice here, he did not say sin will have dominion over you. He said here in Romans 7, verse 1, the, the law is it's not sin that has dominion over you. It's the law that has dominion over you as long as, you, as long as you live. What is the definition of sin? It's when we break the law, 1 John 3, 4. Let's see here. Well, while I'm here in Romans 7, I forgot to read this. Verse 18 says this in Romans 7. Maybe it's verse 8. I wrote down verse 18. Let's see here. No, it's not verse 18 of chapter 7. But Paul said we are made free from sin, not free from the law. Righteousness is, is all of God's commandments. If you want to be free from sin, then you got to obey God's commandments because God is not going to impute righteousness to you if you're deliberately rebellious. Now, everybody... But you're not deliberately rebellious. You're not planning to go out here and kill somebody today. You're not planning to go out here and rob the convenience store on the, right, on the way home from church. You're not planning to do those things. But if you slip up, you'll be forgiven. The definition of righteousness is Psalm 119, verse 172. All of God's commandments are righteousness. Did you, was there a question? There's a comment. A comment, okay. And C posted that Acts 1730, in the times of, ignor of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. And the ignorance he winks at is sometimes the lost, but frequently the saved as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Acts 17, right? Yes. God winked at ignorance, but now he's commanding us to repent. When you don't know, God winks at it. But once you know the truth, he says, now you better repent. That's a good point. Now, <clears throat> for time's sake, I won't ask you to turn there. But Paul said this, Romans 7, 25, I myself serve the law of God. Second and third line there. I myself serve the law of God. So therefore, he was serving righteousness. Now, verse 24 of Matthew chapter 7, we're not through yet with the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine, do you hear what Jesus is saying to you? And does them. Not just, oh, I'm under grace. I, I can live any way I want to. No, no. If you will do his sayings, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. 1 Corinthians 10, 4 says, Christ is the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew. Now keep that statement there in mind. And beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Are you founded upon Christ? How, do you, how is your life founded upon Christ? Because it's founded upon what he said, his sayings, his words. And everyone who hears these sayings of mine, now I want everybody to pay attention, and everybody online, pay attention. If you hear these sayings of Christ and does them not, will be likened unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. Now notice the wording in verse 27. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew. The exact same words, the same storm. And beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. The same storm hits the righteous man who's founded his life on Jesus Christ, and he makes it through the storms of life. Another man, he, his life is founded on sand, the traditions of men. 
chapter, uh, I think it's chapter 7 of Jeremiah. What is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord? The wheat is like God's word. The chaff is what you throw away. You don't need it. If you found your life on the word of God and on the sayings of Christ, when the winds come, when the storms come in your life, you'll survive. You'll weather it through. When the great tribulation comes, you're going to be okay. You'll be taken care of. But if you found your life on chaff, if you found your life on sand, you're going to fall one day. When that storm comes, you're going to fall and fall down badly. So this is what Jesus wants us to know. Are there any questions now on what we call the Sermon on the Mount? There's a lot in that message, I'm telling you. Five, six, and seven. Were there any other questions? I know we're a few minutes, a few seconds delayed on in there. Not yet, but there we very well may be. <clears throat> well, we'll see if any other questions come up. Any questions out here about anything or comments? We're under grace, but Jesus said, under grace, live by every word of God. All the commandments, all the statutes, all the judgments, all the do's and don'ts, everything you find in the Bible, do it. Even when it says turn the other cheek, do that. Iniquity, uh, the word in English means sin. The Greek word anomos means to be without law. Well, if you transgress the law, you're sinning. First John 3, 4 says that. So iniquity, or the Greek word that Jesus used, anomos, I hope everybody can see that, uh, it means to be without law. And if you say the law is done away, you're without law. You're anomos. You're in iniquity. If you say the law is done away, you're in iniquity. People say, but I don't have to keep the law. Fine. Let me say one final thing and we'll conclude. Salvation is 100% grace, but reward, Matthew 16, verse 27, reward is 100% according to your works. And if you are not living by God's law and you don't have the proper works, you'll still be in God's kingdom by grace. And some people say, that's all I care about. Okay, that's all you'll get. Remember the one talent man that he brought the talent back to Christ and said, here you go. So the reward that God wants you to have, you're not going to get. God may have called you to a great reward, but you're not going to get it unless you're keeping his commandments. It's reward. It's in the Baptist church. They don't necessarily call it reward. So I think people get confused about that because they say, well, you'll have so many stars in your crown. You'll have stars in your crown. They don't look at it as being a tangible reward. It's not it is a very tangible reward. Luke 17, beginning in verse 11, tells you what that is. That you're going to be ruling over cities in this world. Not up in heaven, here on this earth. But you may get five cities or ten cities. You may get a bunch more. But the Baptist church, I, know, I was Baptist for 32 years of my life. And bless and your heart. I know, bless my heart. I'm recovering. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, former Baptist Anonymous. Anyway, that's what I said. Well, if you're not ruling over cities, what good is it to have a crown? It's just a pretty hat. A crown is nothing more than a pretty hat to wear. And frankly, I don't wear hats. Yes, sir. I know a lot of people, even when they, you tell them the truth and you tell them and they read it for themselves and see it, they still stop and don't want to listen. They don't want to listen. They just don't. You know? Well, one final thought about that. God is not calling everybody to the greatest reward. How could he call everybody to the highest reward? You know, it's just like if everybody became a billionaire in America, who would be serving tables? Nobody. <laughs> so God isn't calling everybody to the highest rewards. But for those of us here who understand God's law, remember our reward is tied to our works. The more works you do, the greater reward. Any other comments? Did we get any more on there? Just that a couple of people said thank you, great message, and that they really enjoyed this series. Good, good, good. Yeah, this is the end of the series. Now, next week, I don't know what we'll be going into. Uh, you pray that God will give me the right message that all of you need to hear and that people out there need to hear. And because I always want to make sure that, and I always pray first. I don't just pick a message. I say, God, what do the people need? So you that pray is, that God will give me the, I can the message. To that. That is the truth. Yeah, it's what the people need. He could easily, over, he keeps all his sermons in notebooks, and he's got every one he ever wrote, I think. And he could easily, if he just was tired and just go pull one out of a notebook, and it could be something none of us, even me, have ever heard. I've never 
I've never done that. Yeah. I always pray for fresh new material. God's given me fresh revelation every day now. It, it, when I pick up my Bibles, God's given me fresh revelation. It's wonderful. Good to have everybody here. Shanita, good to see you again. And Agnes. Okay, what's your question? Have you heard any more of the temples? A few weeks ago, I gave an update on it where they're very, very serious about getting it started. They have to wait till the Israeli government gives them the go-ahead. But they have everything now ready. You know, over the last several years, they've been building stuff for the temple, getting all the furniture together. They got the vestments for the priests. They started a new school to train Levites to offer up sacrifices. And they now have a Sanhedrin that's sending people out to observe new moons, which the Jewish calendar doesn't even do. Because they know when they build the temple, they got to go back to the new moon calendar. They're absolutely ready. So, hey, when they start building that temple, you better get your bags packed because Jesus is coming very soon. That's why we ought to be in church every week and studying this Bible every single day. Any other questions? Good question. Any other questions? Good to have everybody okay. I don't want to hold you too long. So we're dismissed. Thank all of you for watching. And if you have any questions, be sure to send them in. God bless everybody.